This is Real Talk, the Customer Insights Show with Jen Vogel. Join Jen and her guests for this live discussion around topics that will help you understand your customers better. Also available on podcast channels. This live stream is presented to you by Vox Pop Me, the leader in video research. Here's today's live conversation. Hello, insights professionals, marketers, and everyone who wants to understand their customers better. Thank you for joining me for another LinkedIn Live of Real Talk, the Customer Insights Show. Uh, before we get started, I want to do a quick plug for the Virtual Insight Summit, which kicks off just two weeks from today, which I cannot believe. Um, if you haven't yet registered, you can do so at the link below um, to join a virtual event unlike any other you've experienced before. So let's get to it. Offering good customer experiences across the company certainly is important. And one way to do that is by building teams that work well together and make customer centricity a priority. So today we wanna to talk about building high performing teams that scale customer value and help turn that value into demand. So to discuss this topic, I'm joined by Tara Robertson. Tara has built and continues to build high-performing teams. She's currently the CMO at Teamwork and formerly at Sprout Social. Of course, we wanna hear how building value-centered teams that work can help us drive demand and improve customer experience. Before we get to Tara live in person, take a look at this clip from a keynote from her, how teams dig into data. So how to analyze your surveys, here's an example of the survey that we ran. Um, we read every single response that comes in, and then we start to categorize them based on what we see. So it, we go really, really in depth. A lot of people sometimes will look at this or come into this process and say, no, there's gotta be a better way. Now, let me just run a macro, or let me figure out a way that I can get this together without having to read. Reading is the most important thing you can do because it helps you understand and put yourself in the shoes of your users. If you haven't run surveys, here's some cool templates that I'd recommend that you try out. One is a survey calculator to know how to get to that number for statistical significance with your results. Um, but most important with it is if you send a survey, unlike this one that I talked about that has thousands and thousands of responses, you don't need to analyze every single one of those, but you do wanna analyze to a point to where you know that that data is sound. Um, the next one is a survey analysis tool, which I built at my former job, where you can actually go in and use that data to actually analyze yourself and start to use that from an Excel spreadsheet. Awesome. Welcome to today's episode, Tara. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, me too. And that, that clip, you know, point to understand what customers are saying, we really have to listen to them and, and their, you know, understand kind of what they're trying to tell us. Um, we'll just jump right in. I, you know, I bet the teams really need to work well together to, to make that worthwhile, all that effort. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they, I'd say it's something that no matter what department you're in, how you're working, if you're looking at building customer research, it has to be something that you're doing across the entire business. Uh, so that you can make sure that you're looking at what questions am I asking? What solution am I trying to solve for? And so uh, I, I would say working cross collaboratively and building those teams to kind of all, all dig in together are that you stand in the beginning. Yeah, that's such a good, it's such a good point. And, you know, I mean, something that we have talked about from time to time here on the show, that that collaboration is so important. And for you as, you know, you lead the marketing function, you know, how does customer research and customer insight fit in your team that, you know, as compared to the a formal insights team? Or do you do you not have an insights team at all? Like, how does that work for you? I think that's a great question. And I would say it's really regardless of what team you have, whether it's an team in particular, I will always lean on the, the statement that I'm allergic to silos. And this is why this is so important in regardless of the team. If you are a customer driven business, customer insights needs to be sitting at the foundation of what you do. 
And so I've worked in companies where it has been a customer insights team that you're working with them on your process and they then distill it back to anybody else looking for insights or also in teams where you're leading the charge, but that doesn't mean that you can do it by yourself in a silo. And so, for example, we're running a customer survey right now at Teamwork. And so in order to get that live, there's all of this heavy lifting we need to do to make sure we're aligned with our customer experience team or customer success on who we're reaching out to, what are the questions we're asking, that we're aligned with product on any of the questions that they've recently sent out and that we're not either A, duplicating efforts or recreating the wheel, or B, that we're aligned on the things that we're asking for and see that we're, we're really getting those insights from the internal team before we solidify getting that out into market. And that becomes so important because then what you're doing is one, you're not just building a great customer experience from the outside looking in, but you're also starting to build something that every single department can benefit from. And so the survey that we're doing right now in marketing is something that we will share that feedback with product in case we get feedback on product updates or things that customers are looking for that they're unhappy with right now. We're gonna want that and put it into our product roadmap for our customer experience team. If we have an unhappy customer or a thrilled customer, we have that opportunity to create a even better experience. And so I think you have to start with what, is, what am I solving for? But then how else can everybody get, really benefit from the data that we're starting to build out before you just hit the go button? Yeah. And I think too, when you get other departments involved at the start of mm -hmm. like really defining what that question is that you're trying to answer or what the objective of the study is, they're more bought into the results too. You right. know, if, if we're kind of all on the journey together, as opposed to, hey, we've we've done this research and here you can probably benefit from it too. Um, you know, there's just a lot more at stake when someone is uh, from another department is involved oh. from the start. I'd even go so far as to say the customer experience becomes so much better too, because the last thing you want to do is send out a survey and ask somebody, if you had a magic wand, what would you change? And then they get on the phone with a success rep or a sales rep the next day and they're like, what don't you like about our product? Then you feel disjointed, right? And so I think one, it's getting the buy-in, which is exactly right, making sure you're not duplicating, but also making sure you're you're using that in a way that creates a better customer experience, which is what you know we're really solving for here. Yeah, yeah, it's so important to improve the customer experience in the feedback itself, in addition to actually leveraging the feedback to continue to improve right. the customer experience. Right. And I have to just laugh for a second and go on a bit of a tangent because that magic wand question is my favorite question um, for customer research. And I learned that question from Gia Laudi, who was on the oh, show yeah. about a month ago, and she introduced us. So I, as soon as you said it, I just thought, oh my gosh, that is so Gia. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's just such a great way to ask a question and get really good feedback in a non you know, confrontational way, you yes. know, because everybody has a magic wand and wants to change mm -hmm. things. And so it gives you that opportunity to share feedback and then gather that feedback uh, in where you can improve, which yeah. is my favorite kind of feedback. Totally, totally. It's such a, it, it just creates a different mindset for the person answering and, th and like thinking a little bit differently about, you know, how they communicate their problem and how they would solve it if they could do it on their own. There's so much great learning that comes from that question. Absolutely. And Gia also is an absolute superstar and I love her. So. <laughs> she is. <laughs> We're going to have to CC her on this episode. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in that video clip that we played, you say your team reads all answers mm -hmm. in surveys and, you know, being a, a video insights platform, you know, we, we bring in uh, transcripts from videos. And I love to to read them, but also like, you know, having tools to scale that is really important. So, you know, that reading is a really manual process. So like what role does technology play when you're trying to scale that feedback? Sure. Yeah. And I think honestly, this is part of where, and we showed this in the clip, actually understanding how many you have to read in order to get to some form of significance has always been part of what I felt is important with teams. Um, I probably would be a little bit of a dinosaur in my answer in this one in where I love technology, but when it comes to customer research and customer survey, uh, and, and maybe eventually you kind of get to the stage where you can potentially use technology, but I think reading and spending the time 
in those answers and spending the time truly understanding, regardless of your job, and even more importantly, if you're a CEO or a CMO, digging in and just listening to that feedback is what's it's what creates empathy in us and make sure that we really truly understand what people are saying. And so, yes, you can run it through a tool. But at the same time, when you're parsing through all of those transcripts and all of that great data, um, going through and actually doing the work, whether it's a couple hours or a day's worth of work, is some of the best time that you'll spend when it comes to how you can take that insights or take those insights and put them into a campaign or into your copywriting or into your talk tracks. Yeah, totally. And I guess I, I think there's probably like different levels right? There's like yeah. certain things that are certain questions you want to ask that you want like the most volume, you know, the the most automation and like maybe a quantitative uh, result. Mm -hmm. There's like a middle ground where you want a bunch of transcripts or something and you, you actually do want to read them. Then there's like even further, I know for us, like when we're kind of building our different research programs, it's like what quant data, what qual data, Mm -hmm. We analyze in bulk and then which people do we need to like have a one on one interview with and, you know, exactly. actually speak to them. And, you know, there's almost like a spectrum of the types of feedback that you want to get based on, you know, the problem you're trying to solve or the question you're trying to answer and who you're talking to. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, so let's focus a little bit on building that team to drive value and demand. Where do you start and what do you mean by value specifically? That's a great question. And I think we talked about this um, when we were initially talking about this session and digging into uh, how do you use customer insights and research within marketing and across the business. And my, my reaction was I'm a strong believer as a marketer that our job isn't just to create demand, it's actually to create value. And yes, I do have to care about the demand funnel and I do have to care about acquisition and growth and everything in between and beyond. Um, but what I care the most about is that value and that value metric. And what I mean by value is when you think about value for yourself, it's about finding something that's useful. It's it's looking for, and, and I know Gia talks a lot about this, and we use this a lot, that jobs to be done methodology or approach in thinking about what is it that people are hiring us or, or looking to purchase our product or service, um, whatever it is that we offer, not because they want a tool, but because they want a better version of themselves. They have a pain, they need to solve that pain. And so when we think about value, we're thinking about how do we make this person's life better? And that's why people are coming and, and hiring us or purchasing our, our software or whatever it is that they're doing is looking for a better version of the pain that they're feeling and to get out of that. And so solving for that and generating demand that's rooted in value is what actually creates lifetime value. It's what creates customers that you that stick with you time over time. And so that's where I think that customer research becomes so important. And um, I believe that that's something that every team, when you talk about high functioning teams and how they all work together is responsible for. We can't just look quantitative, even though quantitative, we have to have a qualitative component to all of it because the qualitative is, is really what tells us the why. And it tells us that value component that Google Analytics can't really tell you. It can tell you the what, and the what is really important. And it can tell you the conversion rates and all of those things that you want to impact, but it doesn't tell you how. And I think that's that's where that value becomes critical. And it's something that every single team member should be knowledgeable of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And I, you mentioned like customers are not looking for a tool. Like one of my all-time favorite Seth Godin quotes, I a quarter inch drill bit They're They want a quarter inch hole, you know, and you have to figure out how to communicate to them that your product right. is going to provide the value that they're looking for. And I think it's a, you know, it's really important what you're saying about like the priority is providing value and that value mm -hmm. will drive the demand as opposed to like flipping it the other way around of focusing on demand and then providing value later. Right. Um, and I think that jobs to be done framework that you're talking about, like if you could talk a little more about, you know, kind of how you use that, I think that's really 
And the way that you want to think about jobs to be done is um, kind of exactly what I had just mentioned in where you're looking at the pain that someone's trying to solve and, and creating that better, better version of them. Um, the concept behind jobs is that, you know, people are hiring you to solve that, to create that better version. And so you're looking to answer the question of what is their pain? What is their motivation to them want to buy? And then what is their dreamer state? And that gets kind of broken into almost a, a user statement of, when I do this, I want to do this so that I can do that. Uh, and often you have multiple different customer personas or user types that break down to variants of what job people are looking to solve. Mm -hmm. And so at Teamwork, for example, we work with every segment um, and our ideal customers really is in that agency kind of professional services sweet spot. But that doesn't mean that every other segment that we work with uh, isn't also getting value from our product. And so the value that an agency might get, such as never missing a billable minute or other opportunities on how they leverage our, our platform is very different than another business. And so that means that the way that we essentially generate demand, the way that we think about onboarding, the way that we think about kind of supporting them at every stage of the funnel um, is relatively different. And that doesn't mean that you have to create a different framework for every single one. That's kind of that end state that we all dream of getting to. Um, but you start with understanding what is the commonality across you know, all of your segments and then build out from there. But really understanding that when I want, so I can, so that I can mindset so that you're kind of moving people along that vision of dreamer state. Yeah, I love that. I love that approach. It's very simple. And I think that's a, that, uh, you know, having different kind of personas or different people with different jobs is a huge marketing challenge. And oh, when, like when you're saying like, that is the dreamer state of like having an individual value and like really like personalizing is the is the dr the dream, but it's really tough to get there. That's a huge challenge um, when you've got a lot of different buyers. Yeah, but you know, a great way to get there is customer surveys. So that's kind of why we start and why those become so important is you start to understand and parse through the patterns that you're seeing mm -hmm. through, you know, I, and this is where you start out if you're starting to build some time, some type of personalization or contextual approach to how you're building out a lot of that automation or a lot of that sophistication is look at where the biggest patterns are and build for that. Then you start to look for those other segments and those other ways that you can look to um, how you add in a lot more of those, those layers or personalizations. Yeah, I completely agree. I think we've gone through sort of a, a, a similar journey where we've, you know, we try to identify like, how are the personas alike first? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we like, it's our natural state to look at how they're different. Like, oh, mm -hmm. this, this segment is very different from this other segment. But um, the way that we can really be most effective is by figuring out how they're the same. You know, right. where are the similarities in their in their problems that they're trying to solve and then work from there to personalize, just like you're saying. Exactly. That's awesome. Um, and so when how do you know when to change something because the customer's value changes or they're valuing something different. Yeah, I think you you touched on this one a little bit ago. There's a lot of different kinds of surveys and insights that you could be collecting. And uh, I'm definitely a fan of a survey isn't a one and done. You only send out one survey and then you get the results and then you go and build. It's kind of customer insights should be an always on thing. It should be something that you're constantly looking at, improving and iterating on. And the way that I've done this with previous teams and that I'm kind of working on bringing to teamwork because um, I am relatively new on the teamwork team, um, but so excited to be digging into these early stages of standing up and taking a lot of what's already been done um, is that you you kind of break down the variant types of surveys that you have. Um, so one is you've got the big bang annual survey, um, which usually includes product feedback, customer feedback, customer satisfaction score. And it's a lot more complicated. It's a lot more complex. And um, typically you're looking for detailed information. And then you've got kind of your always on. So usually with every piece of content, videos, for example, if they're educational videos that we're running, we should be collecting basic surveys at the end of, you know, was this useful? 
was this helpful? Yes or no? We should be looking at if they, if it's an educational video again, did they take that lesson and adopt it in the way that they're leveraging the platform? Um, so that's kind of a tactically adding in a CSAT or some form of understanding to each of those. And then always that component of an open-ended question of what else can we improve on? Um, then you've got things like your NPS, which is your net promoter score. And for us, an NPS, NPS is always on. It's something that triggers based off of, you know, a time bound or, you know, a customer experience that they have. And that's where we're collecting, you know, that understanding of would you recommend us? I am not a fan of using NPS just for saying our NPS score is this. Um, I am a fan of using our NPS to actually identify who are the unhappy customers, why are they unhappy, and let's follow up with them. Let's create a better experience for them and make sure that we're acting on that. Who are our promoters? Are they people that we could be leveraging to leave a review on a review site? Are they somebody that we can start to build a case study from, um, but kind of collect that ongoing insights as well? Uh, and uh, yes, we do look at our NPS score, but I think the insights you glean from that and the opportunity to then follow up on creating A, a better experience or B, leverage the great experience that they're having um, and build that into your, your mechanisms. And then I think you've got kind of your general surveys that are transactional, such as product feedback or product improvements. So this is a very long winded way of answering your question, because I think one, like you should know when you're making those changes or when somebody's not kind of receiving that perceived value, just ongoing, because that's mm -hmm. something that you should be adding it into your ongoing um, just strategy for how you're looking at customer insights. And so things shouldn't be a surprise if you start to see perceived value going in the wrong direction. Or if you launch something like a piece of content and people are like, no, this content stinks, mm -hmm. uh, then you know there's an opportunity for optimization on that. And so I think just really keeping a pulse on that qualitative piece is what gives you those insights into um, are you actually generating the value that you're hoping to? Totally. I think that's so important is like the ongoing understanding and like knowing yeah. where are people at because things are changing all the time and people's priorities change all the time. I think every business a year ago this time was like, oh my gosh, all of our customers care about a different problem now. And if they weren't yeah. saying that they should have been because everything flipped on its head in an instant. And so that always on nature of feedback is so important. And mm -hmm. I really love your, um, uh, how you talk about how you use NPS, because I think that is a, that is a, an ongoing topic of, you know, there's some NPS haters and there are <laughs> some people who use NPS really well. And, uh, you know, the, the score itself being the metric is mm -hmm. a challenge for companies, I think, like focusing so solely on that metric, but using NPS as a vehicle to understand if customers are actually getting value and being able to identify friction points that you can improve in the journey or, you know, mm -hmm. leverage some of those, you know, loyal fans is like, that's the application where NPS can become really, really valuable. Yeah. And I think it comes where I was saying that quantitative versus qualitative mm -hmm. and NPS could very easily be a what, which is the quantitative side. Mm -hmm. The beauty in it is in the why, which is the qualitative side. And, and if you think about it from your own perspective as an employee, if you're asked about your experience at your company and you say, this is my experience and then nothing happens, then that's not giving you that right experience. And so that's where we expect our employers or we expect our colleagues to follow through. And that's the same thing for the way that you would think about an NPS or a CSAT. It's the score is just the what. It's not necessarily the why or how we follow up on those actions to actually make impact. Yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, so, something else you mentioned, you slid in there, and I didn't, I didn't mention this early. You're what within your first ninety days still? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, hey, I think I'm in. I just entered month three. Amazing. And so, like, how? Where does customer research and customer journey fall into your priorities in your first ninety days as a CMO? Uh, great question. Uh, it is probably one of the most important priorities. I mean, I think you, you've you got your 90 day plan that you're looking at between they're spending time with the team, they're spending time learning the product, um, but spending time and learning your customers and your competitors 
leaders and so I can't actually make impact on the organization if I don't understand what it is that I'm looking for. And that means getting on the phone with customers. It means looking at our customer journey, understanding our drop off points. We've got some surveys that are up and running right now. There's a lot of surveys that our product team that is amazing have done before that they've just sent me all the information and I just carve out time where I'm going in and listening and digging and trying not to actually take action. And that's, you know, that's a hard thing for me because I'm a very action oriented person, but I know <laughs> the importance of in your first 90 days, you have to be so intentional about listening and creating all of that just soaky sponge things that you need to do with everyone yeah. because that's what's going to help set us up for, okay, now how do we actually make impact on the right things versus those little quick wins that need to come in? Yeah, absolutely. And what you just described is exactly what you were you know, mentioning before, you're like walking the talk here, like <laughs> gathering all the insight from your product team that already exists. I think mm -hmm. that's such an important step in designing any kind of research study is identifying what information you already have. What questions have we already asked? What learnings have we already gleaned? And what are the gaps that need to be filled? So right. as you mentioned before, when we're asking customers to answer questions for us, it's not the same question they've already answered for us a week ago, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's not just your product team. It's the whole org, which is what I think we kicked this off with, right? I'm spending time with our sales team and understanding their current process with our success team. And I mean, they're the ones that are on the phones with our customers every single day and our support team. And so, uh, yes, we'll have opportunities for how we then hit the ground running and start to build um, more and a stronger marketing engine. Um, but I've been very lucky to be building off of something that's already great. And there's just so many different insights and people that have been here for a much longer time that I have that can help along the way. And I think it's where you have to enter in with that humility and that empathy of learning. Um, and that that is most important, I think, where I mentioned before, at the sea level than anywhere else, because you have to listen in order to be able to solve. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so, what uh, what kind of skills and mindsets do people on the team, not just on your team, but across the business, need to have? Yeah, great question. So, and I think that this is very dependent on what you're hiring for. And so, I'm going to take functional skills kind of just off the table because if you're hiring someone for a position, you have to assume that they can do the job just at a functional level. And so I look a lot for one, the functional skills, which are those hard skills, but then soft skills that come to the table. Are they, do they have a growth mindset? Do they have the ability to listen and have empathy? Uh, especially when you're thinking about a customer driven approach, uh, you have to enter into the, you don't know what you don't know mindset and that your, your perspective could be wrong. Because at the end of the day, us generating value is one, truly what we believe, but two, even more so what we solve and how we help solve for that. So there's some things that you obviously don't, don't change, right? Our brand is such a critical thing that we need to build and empower and grow. Uh, and so we've got certain values within the business that we look for within people that become really important. Mm -hmm. um, but then when we think about those soft skills, it's definitely being customer driven. It's having a growth mindset, leaving your ego at the door. These things all become really important in order to be able to kind of think through the customer journey. Then on the hard skill side, I'd say uh, definitely analytical for the most part. And that doesn't mean that you need to be an analyst because not everyone is an analyst. I'm not an analyst, but you do have to understand the importance of data, the importance of impact, and the importance of really truly digging in and saying, is this effort worth the impact that we're trying to drive? And if you don't know how to build some of those things, then you partner with the people that do and you ask those questions. Um, so I think data and having that analytical capabilities is really important. And then really just team camaraderie. You know, I think uh, I, I think sometimes it's very easy to underplay the importance of chemistry within a team and the importance of just being able to have that glass half full mentality. And then this could kind of play to our values that we have within the business. But I do think that that's you know critical because you've got to you got to have fun doing what you're doing because we do it so many hours out of the day. Um, and so I think it's that combination of hard skills, functional expertise, analytical 
wanting to learn and then those soft skills of, you know, being empathetic. Yeah. I think that, I mean, we can talk about empathy every week on the show. I, it's, <laughs> it's such an important piece. And uh, uh, one of the one of the, the guests on the show a few weeks ago, uh, uh, Megan from PepsiCo was saying that she was a psychology major in college and in an insights function. And I just thought like that is such a, a close tie-in, right? Like having to understand, like really empathize and understand people's um you know, motivations and drivers and, um, you know, kind of what, what keeps them going. But, but one of yeah. the other things you said about, you know, is the effort worth the impact and using the data to really drive that? Could you, could you talk a little more about that? Sure. I think it's interesting because we actually, I actually was in a conversation about that this morning. Naturally, earlier on in my career, I would be more of a go off the gut person. And I think you learn the hard ways that sometimes the big ideas aren't necessarily the right ideas or the quick fixes are a distraction to the things that are actually going to make an impact in the business. And so I, I'd be cautious in saying not everything has to be something that's so broken down to the data that you're stuck in the, you know, robotic, let's, let's make sure we're only doing what's impactful because there are, is an element, especially in marketing, where you have to take a risk. Uh, but I do still believe that those risks and those opportunities are grounded really in insights. And so one is you've got your customer insights, which are obvious that we've been talking about, uh, which is really what are the things that our customers are looking for? What are the patterns that we need to help? What are the, the problems that we're hoping to solve for? And kind of building just your functional foundational, these are the things that you need to do there. And that effort will always be worth it. Um, however, not everything needs a big splash of an effort. And so what I mean by that is if you use a product launch, for example, we tier our product launches. So if it's something where the data is showing us that um, there's a huge opportunity here, there is huge market potential, our total addressable market is massive, it's for prospects and customers, and it's a, it's a big launch, then we should put a lot of effort into that. We should be thinking about um, creating a video, creating a campaign, starting to do something like a digital event potentially, or really how do we make this something that generates the most impact that we're hoping for with what we're trying to solve. And we'll often have, you know, what is your known KPI? What is the goal that you're working on? Whether that is adoption, whether that's awareness and generating leads, uh, just really making sure that you've got that stake in the ground of your KPI. If it's new, though, we'll often also have a learning goal. And so what am I hoping to achieve with this like big launch that I'm working on? And so we at least put some kind of a KPI that holds us accountable. And then there's that closed loop on did we do the thing that we were hoping to do? And this is where you can kind of benefit between the is it a risk or is it a known? And if it was a risk and it didn't work out, what did we learn based off of our learning goal? If it did, what did we learn so that we can do it again? And then you've got your like what we call our tier two or our tier three projects, which is, you know, a small update or change management or something that we just need to know. Uh, and those often you'll still get those requests like we want a really big video or we want to do a webinar or we want to do this big sell sheet. And so you have to look at the data and say, what is the opportunity? And is that opportunity equate to how big of an effort you want to put behind it? And the insights as well as in kind of making some of those calls when you can look at that opportunity cost that you have coming into it and where is it worth making the big splash and the risk versus where is it something that you're like mm, yeah we'd love to do that however that would actually take impact away from doing this other big thing that we're working on yes you are speaking my language <laughs> <laughs> i think you know it's it's so there's always so many things that we want to do as marketers yeah. and uh, product teams too. There's always new features we, we want to build to uh, make a big splash about. And it, it's so important to have that, you know, have some data to mm -hmm. back up how we're prioritizing because there's only so much time in the day. There's only so many people on the team and totally. so many resources to put, uh, put against it. So, you know, identifying uh, opportunities that are going to have a big impact and are, are low effort, like, let's do those first, right? And, you know, yeah. putting those big effort 
uh, campaigns and and initiatives behind the really large impact um, releases or projects. It's prioritized, and and I also love what you said about you know finding a balance between being so data driven and robotic mm -hmm. and also you know taking some risks and trying some things a little bit differently but there's always some level of data that can help to inform those decisions absolutely yeah absolutely and so um so back to the the teams um mm -hmm. how do you make sure the right players are in the right seats great question so i think this really comes down to expectations and clarity on what that C is there to solve. And so I'm a big believer, one, in just giving people clear alignment on what is their role and what is the role clarity that they need in order to be successful. And that is equal parts responsible for the manager, for the employee, and kind of working together on defining this is your KPI. And sometimes those are soft and sometimes they are much more direct, right? A demand gen marketer, for example, you know what they're responsible for when it comes to whether it's a trial goal or a lead goal or something that helps fuel the funnel versus a designer that's more of a soft role, right? There isn't a clear KPI like your design needs to be of this quality because that can be very subjective. Um, so then you'll start to look at something like what is their velocity? How are they how are they managing their time when it comes to what they're committing to versus what's being delivered? And so regardless of the position, I'm a big believer of putting a number or putting a goal around what people are responsible for. Um, and then building on top of that, uh, building in the right kind of performance review cycles. And so I don't think once a year, twice a year is enough, obviously, for giving feedback. I'm a big believer in just radical candor and constant feedback. Um, but my previous CMO at, at Sprout, who I absolutely loved, she had rolled out that I brought this over to teamwork, these monthly sessions where you go in and you talk about, uh, here are the top three things that you did great over the last month. Here are the top three areas of improvement. And then let's give feedback for me too, and make sure that we're kind of digging into having this constant feedback cycle. Now you don't wait for this meeting. If something doesn't work out well, or somebody makes a mistake, get on the phone with them right away and have that conversation. Or if they do something great, shout it from the rooftop and put it in chat and say, you know, this person did a phenomenal job. Here's why. And so when it comes to making sure you've got the right people in the right seats, it's really about making sure that they know what they're responsible for and that you're following through on giving them direct feedback and you're being radically candid on where they're performing well and where they're struggling and making sure that you're getting that feedback too because it's not just you know an employer to employee relationship it's really about how you work together and i am a huge believer in servant leadership and so the more that i'm here not to hire and manage i'm here to serve the people that work on my department and to help them be successful in their job, then you shouldn't have that question of, are you in the right seat? Um, because that should be a known. And that becomes clear to both of you if they're not in the right seat, just based off of those ongoing feedback loops. I love that mindset of servant leadership and that you're there to make sure that they're successful in their roles. And um, and the, the the goal setting piece, I love the, how you talked about, I mean, you kind of touched on this when you were talking about the KPIs for different initiatives, like there, you can, there's always something you can measure. It totally. might not always be like the clear cut data, but there's something, there's a learning goal or there's some kind of um, something you can put in place to be able to look back and say, was I successful or not? Yeah. And a lot of this even comes back to those soft skills of, I want people to feel comfortable failing and failing forward is so critically important. And so I think it's our job to work with the people on our team to give them that direction on, you know, here's what you're responsible for. Then, then we got to get out of their way and empower them to do great work and coach and support in every possible way, shape or form. And I think that's what creates that right person and right seat mentality, because then you're giving them the opportunities to shine. And look, you're never going to get it right. There will always be some people that are not in the right seats because they were a bad hire. Maybe they're a bad fit. Maybe they're unhappy because of X, Y or Z reason. But the way that you get there shouldn't be a surprise. It should be something that anytime you get to the stage where it's like, I just don't think it's working out, then both of you have the sense of, you know, 
yeah, it's not working out um, because you've been able to keep that feedback loop open on an ongoing basis. Yeah, I think that's so important. I love what you said about um, not having the annual review cycle, like that not being enough. And yeah. um, I'll, I'll take a little moment to do a plug for 15.5, which is a, a piece of tech that that we leverage at Box Pop Me, and yeah. it, it allows you to do weekly pulse check-ins. And yeah. it's designed for exactly that, to remove that annual, you know, we still do an annual review, right? That's part of our process, but we're, we're catching up weekly on how are people doing? How are they feeling? Like, you know, what's what's the priority um, that they're working on and things like that. And so tools like that are available now to, to help foster yeah. that, exactly. Which I think are so great and so yeah. important. And I've used tools like that too in the past and I've like, I just love them. I love feedback in general, because I do think as we talk about, and obviously that's why we're talking today, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think customer feedback employee feedback is equally, if not more important. And so making sure that you're using these same, same approaches with your teams and kind of following through, like we said, it's not just about giving the number and this is how happy I am. It's about really following through on that experience and making sure that people feel heard. Because at the end of the day, whether we are an employee, whether we are a consumer or a customer, we just want to be heard and we want to get value and we want to make sure that we're kind of seeing that light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a freight train. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I think we can all relate to that. Like we're all just human beings and we <laughs> want our voices to be heard and we yeah. want to buy from companies or work for companies that listen to us. Exactly. The core. Yeah. Um, awesome. This has been such a great conversation. I could go on for a while longer. I actually, you know, we do have a question that I typically ask all of our guests at the start of the show, and I did not ask it at the start. So I'm going to ask it now um, okay. <laughs> before we wrap. But from your experience, um, how has the role of customer insights evolved in companies over the last couple of years? Oh, I love that question. I think it's evolved so much. A few years ago, I, I am a customer nerd through and through and love feedback and love insights. And I feel like just a handful of years ago, it was something that there was just such a small group of people that were talking about it. And now you're starting to see companies building customer experience teams or building insights teams or creating roles like research operations. And so I think this, this customer is first. I mean, you used to hear like content is king and all those cheesy things. And now it's customer. Um, and so I think we're still at this very early stage of what does that mean? And how do we actually deliver a customer first driven business? And um, I know Gia probably talked about customer led growth, which I just love that term. Uh, I'm starting to see things like community led growth too popping up from companies like HubSpot. And so I think in general, just that seeing the entire industry rallying around the customer is exactly where we need to be going and kind of building this customer first mentality through everything that we do. Yeah, uh, totally. And I think like I I agree, it's definitely broadened quite a bit in the last couple of years, whereas there was a time where, um, I mean, dare I say, Insights was siloed within... And it is so much broader now. And companies, it's starting at the top, companies saying we are customer first, we are, you know, PD or whatever it might be, um, is really, uh, really changing how teams outside of the insights mm -hmm. function get involved and have, you know, like come to the party, come to the customer party, because this is impacting everyone. Yeah, exactly. And that people actually care about wanting to read those insights, which is the coolest part. You know, a few years ago, you want to run a survey and it's like, why would I run a survey? Mm -hmm. um, and now I think everybody wants to run a survey. So there's a separate problem there to take <laughs> into it, making sure you're not over surveying, but it's to think all of us to be leading into not just as businesses, but as customers. Yeah, 100%. Well, again, this has been a fantastic conversation. I could probably stay on for another hour. So I want to thank you so much for joining me today. 
Yeah, thank you. This has been really fun. We, we can stay on for a few more hours anyway, but I agree. I could talk about customer insights all day. I love it. Well, thank you. And, and thank you everyone for listening. Please rate and review us on your favorite network. And don't forget to share the show with your friends. In the next episode, I'll be, see you then.